All right, we are going to look at the Grand Stream UCM configuration. This is for the 6100, 6200, or 6510 series. Um, doesn't matter which one you're trying to make, the software is the same. So we start by logging in. Right now everything's default, so admin, admin. Um, if it's not admin, admin, look at the bottom of your device, and the, uh, there could be a password um, sticker to the bottom. Uh, that is for extra security so that people can leave it default. I've already done an overview that explains what each one of these sections does and means um, to help you understand what you're looking for and, and where to find it. If you need that overview, go ahead and click on the link provided and you can go through that um, when you have time or, or you can pause this video and go do it now. To get started, we're going to look at our diagram. The diagram shows all of the phone numbers we want to set up, what we want them to point to, and how each of those settings creates more options and more options all the way to the end of ending at an extension or a voicemail or an outside phone number. We don't start by creating the inbound routes for these. We start by creating all of the things that the routes can point to. So in this process, we're going to go through and starting here, we're going to start with our route diagram first, which, which you can see behind me here. And then we're going to start setting up extensions and voicemails and follow me settings, and then ring groups and IVRs, and then the trunks and the routes. So we kind of work backwards from the end back to the beginning so we can make our inbound routes. So the first thing we're going to do is create extensions. How to create extensions. You click on extensions in the trunk and then you go to the subcategory extensions. From here you can cl click the plus sign and add a either a bulk extensions or a single extensions. We're going to do bulk so we're going to click on batch here which is the method, and what kind of extension we're using SIP. So for the most part, you'll always make a SIP extension. If you need to connect like a fax machine or an analog device, you would make an FXS extension. IAX is another type of extension that we don't use here very often, so I'm not going to go through that. How many extensions do we want to create? In this case, I am going to make 101. Oh, I can only make 100. And based on our diagram, we're going to go 1,200 to 1,300 for our extension numbers. We'll start at 1,201, and I'm going to go 100 extensions. That'll get me to 1,300. Extension incrementation is 1, which means you go 1201, 1202. You can jump by 2s or 3s or 4s or even 5s if you want to leave gaps between. Um, or you can make them one at a time. Permission level, everybody's going to have permission to call out 10 digit numbers or 11 digit numbers, but not internationally. So we're going to give everybody national rights. All of these extensions are not going to have voicemail, so I'm going to disable voicemail. But I want Keep Alive turned on, so I'm going to check that box. Keep Alive to make sure the extension and the phone are talking to each other regularly. If you were making a lot of virtual extensions, you wouldn't turn that on. But I find this, this helps keep, keep BLF lights active and keep registration constant, um, prevents drops, things like that. You can change color ID number, you can set a SIP password. Um, if you hover over though, you'll see that R means random. So it's going to create a random password for everybody, and that's what we want. And then E here means use the extension as the caller ID number. Now there will be another place we'll do caller ID, so leave that alone. So this is, this is it. That's all you really need to set, and you can just hit save, and it will create all 100 extensions. You can go through and modify you know, codecs and faxing and stuff, and other, other settings that we're not gonna mess with, unconditional call forwards, you can do all that right from the get-go here in the batch creation, but you don't need to. You can, you can customize that individually as you need to.
And so I'm going to hit save here. It tells me what it's going to create. And we're going to let it create it. Now, 100 extensions is quite a bit. So it takes a moment to create them all. And voila. Now, I said 1,200. So we're going to create one more. And it's going to be a single extension. And it's going to be 1,200. It's going to have national rights. Only this one's going to have voicemail. And you can see here, it even shows you the SIP password when you're only making one. And it shows you the voicemail password because you're only making one. So we'll set this to 2018, to this, the current year. We're going to skip voicemail password verification because whenever this phone checks its own voicemail, I don't want it to have to punch in its password. We trust everybody on the site, so we're going to do that. If you don't, don't check this box because then they have to type in the password every time. I still want my Keep Alive's turned on. And you can tell here, we have a few more options of settings available to us when we're making just one extension at a time. The auth ID is um, often identical to the extension number. That's uh, the SIP user ID. If you want a different auth ID than SIP user ID, you can type that in here. Um, and you can use two different numbers, so to speak, or even letters. Um, but if you leave it blank, the auth ID is the same as the extension number. Um, that's new. We'll look at that right now. All right, emergency calls call ID. So when you call out, if you want to change the number that it uses as caller ID for emergency calls, you can put that in here. If you don't want the extension active, you can disable it here. We can punch in names. We'll start with mine. And my email address. Oh, I want to do the autofill. There's my email. Send me an email. The user password is for logging in as yourself. Um, right now we're logged into the admin portal or to the UCM's portal using the admin login. If we logged in as 1200, we use this password here. After you click save here, this password disappears and the only way to change it is to completely replace it. You can never actually find out what that password is. If you have more than one extension that you want to, more than one physical phone or soft phone that you want to connect to this extension, you'll want to change the concurrent registrations to be a higher number. Right now, only one device can register as, as this extension. So we'll go ahead and save that one. And boom, we have 1200 and then 1201 all the way through four whole pages of all of the numbers. The greatest per page you can get to is 40. And you can flip through page two and page three all the way up to our 1300 mark. 101 extensions. If you register them, they will show up here as, as registered rather than unavailable, but we won't uh, mess with that right now. Now, these extensions are in here, but I can't use them until I start to hit, until I hit apply changes. So we're going to apply those changes and make all of those available. Now, what about follow me settings? <clears throat> what does that mean? Uh, we looked at all on, our, on our diagram here, um, different extensions use different things, and sometimes we can have an extension ring and then follow me to a cell phone. So it rings the extension, it rings the cell phone, and I thought I had written one in here. I didn't. I didn't write one in here, but I did put it on this diagram. Extensions, voicemails, and follow me settings. So if we were full sending a call directly to an extension, then the follow me setting would follow that phone if it didn't ring to its cell phone destination. And then if you didn't act on the cell phone, it would come back and leave a voicemail on the system. So we're going to start by looking at extension 1200. We're going to edit it. And at the top here, you see we have more tabs now. And you can see the, all of the passwords are grayed out. So you can't just see them. But the voicemail and the SIP password, you can see if you need to. But this one down here, there's no seeing it. You'll never get to know what that is again unless you just reset it. 
Now, if you have this extension, it's active and it's got voicemail enabled, you can go all the way to the last tab to follow me settings. And you can turn that on. So that means that this phone extension will now ring the regular extension at the phone for the allotted amount of time. If there are, is no answer on that phone, it will jump to the following numbers that we list down here. And it will ring that extension, that, that cell phone or landline, whatever you want to forward it to, another, another desk phone. Upon ringing, if you have this box checked here, confirm when answering, the person that picks up the call will, will hear you have a call being forwarded from your extension from whatever number. And it will ask you to accept this call, press 1. Deny this call, press 2. I'm not sure if 1 and 2 are the right options, but it asks you to confirm it. And as long as you have that confirm when answering on, the system will send it back to its, an, an, its voicemail or to this default destination if nobody picks up and confirms the call. If you uncheck this and you're sending it to a cell phone and the cell phone doesn't pick up an answer, it'll go to the voicemail and they will get the voicemail of the cell phone. If you check this, it doesn't go to the voicemail of the cell phone, it comes back to this default destination. All right, what do you want them to hear when they're waiting for the call? You can recreate a custom music on hold like your call is being forwarded and we're looking for the person and, and that's all fine. Or you can just give them a ring. And that's what that does. Skip trunk authorization. If you have a trunk that requires authorization to use, like a password, you can tell it to skip that by checking this box. Otherwise, uh, you'll need to get that password in there. Uh, for what we're doing, we're not using passwords, so we'll ignore that. Use the Callee's DOD for following. DOD is direct outward bound. This is the caller ID that the extension gets. So if I assign an extension to 1200 and check this box, it's going to use the caller ID of assigned to 1200 when it forwards that call on. If I don't, it'll pass the caller ID of the original caller through to the cell phone. Enable destination, we're going to go to voicemail of 1200. So it's going to try to ring through. It's going to demand the confirmation when answering. And if it doesn't get it, it's going to end at the voicemail of this. So the first following number will be an external number. We'll do 4321. That's my external number. It's going to ring it for 30 seconds and then end at the default destination. If I want, I have to add that. If I want, I can add another one. Five 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 four three two. It's going to ring that one for thirty seconds, and it'll go as long as you want it to go, and then dump back to the voicemail. We'll just do the one, and that's how a follow me works. Once that is in place, any time extension twelve hundred is called directly, it will obey that rule. And if it's in a ring group, it'll ignore it. It's only directly dialed calls that, that honor the following we say. So that's how you set up extensions and set up voicemail and set up following. Again, voicemail is just this button right here. Um, remote voicemail is another option. That's if you want another system to handle voicemail settings, which we're not going to mess with today. Once you have extensions and voicemails and your follow me settings set up, we move on to the next section of ring groups. How to set up a ring group. All right, ring groups, we go into call features and ring groups. A ring group allows a set of phones to ring, either simultaneously or in order, have music on hold or ringing in the background, um, and then dumps to a, a destination of your choosing. We're going to call this in group one. By default, it picks in the extension range of 6400s, so we're going to leave that. We're going to tell it that, well, let's look at our diagram here. Ring group one is going to ring 1200 to 1210 and then go to voicemail. 
So 1200. Hold down shift. Oh, it didn't work. I gotta check them individually. Now, if you had a, another uh, Grandstream phone connected with a peer trunk, the uh, extensions of the other system would show up on here too, and you could put those in that end group, and you could ring across systems. That's all possible. The ring strategy, you can ring in order. Most commonly, I ring simultaneously. Everything rings together. Music on hold. This is what the person calling in will hear while the phones are ringing. Now, the, the thing to make note here is that the phone system answers the call the moment it starts playing this. So if you have something that requires um, requires you to not answer the call because you don't want to charge them a toll charge or something like that, don't set this to anything. Leave it the way it is. If uh, you're using SIP trunks and the amount of calls doesn't matter, I usually set this to default ring back time. This lets them hear ringing back as soon as uh, the phones start ringing. And it warns you if music on hold is set, not set to none, an inbound route via an analog trunk may incur costs because that inbound trunk answers it the moment it starts playing the ring back. Custom prompt, oh, I forget. Ring to announce to a caller. I forget which one it announces to. It's a, it's a message to the caller, which is the person calling in, I believe, and lets them know what's going on. I rarely use it. Um, there are some custom reasons to use it. We're not going to go over it here. Ring timeout, this is usually about 20 seconds, you know, four or five rings, sometimes it's 30 seconds. You can set this to auto record. It will record every call then that passes through this ring group. Uh, this is new. Toggle support for calling configure. Interesting. We won't worry about that for now. Um, replace display name. If you check this box, the caller ID name that appears on your phone will be replaced with this name up here. Um, if you need that, that's helpful sometimes. And then at the end, after all is said and done, it rings all of those phones simultaneously playing a ring back tone for 20 seconds. And if nobody picks up, you go to voicemail is what we decided of 1200. And voila, we have ourselves a ring group. We're going to make a second ring group. I'm going to go a little faster on this one. Ring group two, 1250 to 1260 and ends at IVR one, but I haven't created IVRs yet. So what do I do? In group two, 1250 to 60. 15, 1, 2, 3, 9, all those in there, and 60. We're going to ring simultaneously. Uh, we're going to do ring back. We're going to do it for 20 seconds. And we're ending at an IVR. But I don't have that IVR made yet, so I can't put that in here, which means I'm going to have to come back to this. And this is where our diagram helps us out because it reminds us to do so much stuff. So after I've created my IVRs, I'm going to come back here and change the destination to have that IVR as one of the options. Now, I could have made my IVRs first, but my IVRs also point to ring groups. So it's six or one half dozen of the other. You have to pick which one you do first. Either way, you've got to go back and change something. What else do we have to make? Ring groups, cues. IVRs, and then double check everything. All right, so let's go to queues next. How to create a call queue. 
First you go to Call Features, Call Q, and you hit Add. Much like the ring groups, um, they have a lot of similar settings, but the ability to leave them and, and hear the ringing in the background and things like that are different. The extension numbers go to 6500. We're going to call it Q1. The strategy is ring all. You can choose linear, least recent, fewest calls, random, round robin, lots of options for a call queue. Music on hold is going to be ring back tone. Um, if we wanted, we could put your call is important to us. Please remain on the line and the next available operator will be with you shortly. And play music or something. We can create any kind of music on hold sequence we want. Um, just ringing is fine too. Max queue length. Configure the maximum number of calls to be queued at once. This number does not include calls that have been connected with agents, only calls that are still in the queue. Now it's set to zero right now, which means unlimited, and that's the default. Wrap up time. This is the amount of time that a person that has answered a call has before the phone call starts ringing again. So if you want to have no delay between when you hang up a call and when you receive your next one, you set this to zero. 10 seconds is the person hangs up the phone, they have 10 seconds to jot stuff down before their phone starts ringing again. Ring time. Um, each agent will ring this amount of time. If you have it set to like linear or any of these others, that timer is important. If you have it set to ring all, not so important. Retry time, the number of seconds to wait before ringing the next agent. So there will be a gap in between when the first one stops ringing and the next one starts ringing when you have a different ring order, like linear, and that's the amount of time between. Auto record records all calls that go through this call queue. Max wait time, the time represents the absolute amount of time to allow a caller to stay in a queue before no one before no one answers the call. And so 60 seconds, it would, it would ring constantly for 60 seconds and then go to this destination. So this is where we would change where the exit is on that queue. So for Q1, we decided it's going to ring 1220 to 1230, have an option for a voicemail out, but repeat forever. Let's see if it'll let us do that. So zero typically is the wait forever option. And it still lets me choose an out, so we're going to set it to voicemail. Destination prompt. Configure the voice prompt cycle in this queue while playing the voice prompt. And you can press one to transfer to a failover destination. So this is your out. This is your voicemail out. Um, we set our max wait time to zero, which means this should ring endlessly, um, even though I have a, an exit, exit strategy there. If I enable this every, let's say every 20 seconds, I want you to play this special custom prompt that I create. And I would create the prompt in prompts, which is here, which we can uh, show you where that is later. And the exit is voicemail. Of 1200. And that's what happens when they press 1. And so if you want to get out, the, the prompt is going to say, your call is important to us, and remain on the line. So you might pair these together sometimes so that music on hold up here, you might set to just music, and then every 20 seconds you pay the, play the special prompt that says, your call is important to us, please stay on the line, press 1 if you want to leave a voicemail. And that's a ring group. Oh, I didn't add the agents. So the agents are in the last settings here. There's a bunch of uh, advanced settings we can mess with. I'm not going to go through those right now. But the agents are added over here. And this is 1220 to those people are permanently in that queue. 
There's ways to set up dynamic agents as well, so they can log into the queue and out of the queue. We're not going to talk about any of that today. The second queue that we're going to make is 1240 to 1249. No way out unless no agents are present. Let's see what that looks like. So we're going to ring all. Q2. Set Q1 to zero endlessly and agents are twelve forty to twelve forty nine. Let's do that. That's right. Okay, that should go all the way down to forty nine. And, and here's one of the advanced settings. Leave when empty. Configured when the caller has been disconnected from the queue if the queue has no agents anymore. And the failover destination will be the other queue in this case. So, strict. Um, yes, callers will be disconnected from the queue if agents are paused or invalid. So we're going to set this to yes. So you're going to leave with it's empty and you're going to go to queue one. Dial an empty queue, no. Callers cannot, so the caller can't even enter this queue if there's no agents logged into it. So if uh, we had this set to dynamic agents and there were no agents in here logged in, it would hit this queue, go nope, can't do it, and go to queue number one instead. Okay, you apply those changes and now those queues have become available to use. The next step is creating IVRs. How to create an IVR? Start by going to Call Features, and you click on IVR. Add IVR, and we're going to look at our diagram. We want an IVR with these options. And then we want a second IVR with these options. Now we've already created our call queues. I haven't created IVR number two yet. Call Q2, outside number, voicemail. So in this case, um, I'm going to create IVR2 before I create IVR1. So if I want them to be numerically right, um, I need to see that. So my first IVR is going to be IVR1, which is 7,000. So I'm going to make IVR2 and use 7,001 just because I want, just because I want IVR1 to be the first number. IVR2 to be the second number. I'm going to allow this this uh, trunk this uh, sorry I'm going to allow this IVR to be able to call out because I need it to go to an external number. So it needs to have national rights. This is for the IVR to be able to make an outbound call. When somebody calls in, if I want them to be able to dial any extension number without having to be told about it, I keep this checked. If I don't want them to be able to do that, I uncheck. I don't mind. I want him to be able to reach anyone he wants if he knows the extension number without being told. There's a blacklist, whitelist, stuff like that you can mess with. You can also replace the display name of your caller ID with the IVR name if you so need. Uh, alert info, that uh, is if you're going to change a ringtone, something like that, based on which IVR it goes through. The prompt is the recording that is heard. Um, you've reached blah, blah, blah company, press one for this, two for that, three for this, four for that. And that's the prompt that you have to record. Right now it's just going to say welcome, and that's all you get. Response timeout is how long, oh, I missed one, the digit timeout is how long between digits do we wait for you to hit another digit. So if you start typing in 134, but wait three seconds between the one and the three, it's going to send it to number one. So you have to type quickly um, within three seconds between digits if you want to continue typing in an extension. If you press one and wait three seconds, it's going to go to option number one. The response timeout is how long after the IVR finishes playing do I do my next step? When we have it set to 10 seconds. So after the last recording is done, they have 10 seconds to decide something, or it's going to go to one of these 
repeat options. Right now we have the system told to repeat it three times if they don't press anything or if they uh, press something wrong. If they do that three times, this is the recording that gets played to them before it does the next step. The next step is on the next page. So after three times of not pressing something or pressing something wrong, it's going to say goodbye and hang up on them. And we can change that. We can make it go to a voicemail. We can make it go to a queue. We can make it do whatever we want. I'm going to leave them as default. As far as our options, we want one to go to ring group two, two to go to an IVR, Group two, two to go to an IVR. Oh, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. This is IVR two. So we're over here. One's going to go to a cell phone. Two is going to go to an extension with fog. Let's fix that. One is going to go to an outside number, like a cell phone. So two is going to go to an extension with follow me, which is my extension, which we created earlier. Three is going to go straight to voicemail, and four is going to go to ring group two. And we're going to create the recording that allows that to be set. Thank you for calling, press one for bill, two to find Lucas, three to leave a message, and four for sales. Something like that. Save that. Now that we have IVR2 created, we can create IVR1, which can also dial trunks, or dial the trunk, and can reach other extensions, has national rights, uh, all the same settings down here, key pressing events, ring group 2, IVR2, call Q2, And you can really build these any way you want. And then outside number and voicemail. And you can build them in, in layers. You can layer IVR on IVR on IVR and have lots and lots of menus or have no menus at all, it's completely up to you. And apply those changes. Now if we go back to our original diagram, set up ring groups, queues, IVRs, and then double check the destinations of everything. Because IVRs were created last, queues second, ring groups third. If I had any ring groups pointing to the other things, I have to go back and fix them. To look at that, I have ring groups that point to extensions and end at IVR number one. That was ring group two, actually, that does that. So we're going to go back and look at our ring groups, and ring group two is supposed to end. Now that I have it created, I can send it to IVR2. Was it 2? IVR1. Let's see. And this one was going to voicemail. We can double check that if we need to. Yeah. And then apply that change. So once you've gone through and double checked everything to make sure that all of the stuff that's supposed to be pointing to each other is pointing where it needs to be. Now we can go back and make the inbound routes that point to these things that we've just created. So to make an inbound route, if we go there, we have to understand how to make an inbound route. And to make an inbound route, we need a trunk, because if I try to add it, it's going to tell me, you don't have any trunks. So we need to make a trunk for it to connect to. There are two types of trunks you can make that uh, we use commonly. One is an analog trunk. 
This is if you're using an actual uh, analog telephone line to reach your phone system. Um, this is the this technology is going away, but it still works. It's still fine. You select how many lines you have coming in. You give it a name. We call it Anna One. And the only real thing you need to double check on this um, in the U.S. you want to double check your caller ID. If your trunk has caller, if your lines have caller ID, you make sure this is checked. If your lines don't have caller ID, you make sure it's unchecked. Otherwise, it won't work. And the other thing is the caller ID scheme. Belcor Tel Telcordia is the default one for the U.S. And your tone country, I'm set to U.S. So if you're in another country, you may need to change this. Um, and you may need to change this. For those of us in the U.S. that use caller ID on all of our lines, everything default should work. You just check the lines you want to use and hit save. For VoIP trunks, um, this is where it gets a little trickier. The trunk group can be used to add VoIP trunks that allow for only one concurrent call per channel. And you can add multiple channels to a single trunk so you don't have to create five different inbound routes and, and five different failover routes on outbound routes. You just create one trunk group and use it as one trunk. Um, I'm not going to make this today, but you can add multiple user IDs, as many as you need for each trunk you want to enter for a single host. Um, it's kind of cool. I haven't used it yet. It's a new feature. Um, but uh, from what I've heard, it works just fine. We're going to add a regular SIP trunk here. And the SIP trunk settings for each provider um, may be different. The one I'm going to show you is uh, a company we like to use called Next Vortex. Props to you, Next Vortex. You do a great job. We really appreciate you. Um, so let's look at that. We're going to call this trunk PX1. Now, what we use is two concurrent trunks, two side-by-side -side trunks that have unlimited concurrent calls um, as failover. So we're going to create both trunks just to show you what that looks like um, so that you can see it. And this is information you will get from your provider. I know my provider's host name. Each one is going to be different. Um, and these settings here are up to you. Now, NAT is typically left off now. You don't check that unless you have a specific reason to. Um, keep original caller ID. That's if you want to retain the original caller's caller ID when passing a call through out to somebody else. And I like to do that. Keep trunk caller ID. That means no matter what call goes out, it's going to change it to the, DOD, to the caller ID number that's assigned to the trunk. I don't do that. I want the original caller ID kept if possible. Caller ID and caller ID name. Um, these are only typed in if you need to. Um, oh, I didn't change my trunk. The uh, I'm going to back up here at the top. What kind of trunk do you, what type do you need to create? You have a peered trunk or a registered trunk. A peered trunk requires no credentials. Um, and sometimes that's exactly what you need. For these trunks that we're going to create today, we're going to do the registered trunk with credentials. It adds a few more lines and gives me a username, password, and auth ID. Still the same provider name, still the same host name, still the same options here. But once you get down to here, you decide if your trunk needs registration or not. Um, I usually check it. I don't have to, but I choose to. Um, and I also check this, allow outgoing calls if registration fails. Even if the registration isn't working right, I don't care. I want it to still try to send the call with the credentials. And it will. So regardless if the receiving end is giving me confirmation that I'm registered, it's still going to keep sending calls. And uh, for this service, it works great. Again, caller ID, name and number I'm not going to mess with. Uh, username, I have uh, off to the side here. I'm going to paste it in. And the auth ID is the same as the username. The password, you don't get to know. It goes right there. The uh, auth trunk, this is an optional setting based on your SIP provider. If they need 
Um, the UCM will send a 401 response to incoming calls to authenticate the trunk. Not every SIP provider needs it, but some of them do. And you've got to figure that out for yourself. Auto record. This is the most common way I record things. I make a trunk and I click auto record. Every single call passing through this trunk gets recorded. And there's another setting I changed elsewhere that announces to everybody that calls may be recorded. Direct callback, this is a new feature. I haven't tested it yet, but I'm excited to try. It allows external numbers the option to get directed to the extension that last called them. So if I called you from extension 203, you call back in, it will redirect you, give you the option at least to, to, to reach that person that just called you based on your call ID. So kind of neat. Um, I'm excited to try it. It's a very new feature on this system. So that'll be really neat. I'd like to point out at the top, there are no extra tabs here when you're creating a trunk. So after you save it, it's, it's warning me here that this is a, not an IP address, it's a DNS name. So that's okay. After you create your trunk, you go back in to edit it. And now we've got our advanced tab. I go to the advanced tab and I check this box, enable heartbeat detection. There's some more settings here you can mess with if you want. I don't mess with them uh, uh, by default just to get calls coming in and going out. The trunk itself can detect faxes if you want and direct wherever you want it to go, things like that. The maximum number of calls per, per line. If this trunk was a, a limited trunk and it could only do two calls at a time or one call at a time, you change this number. Uh, we're unlimited, so I leave it at zero. Right. I'm going to do that exact same thing with my second trunk, but a little bit faster. So this is the secondary trunk they use for failover. Original caller ID, registration, save, go back in, advanced, enable heartbeat detection. This helps me monitor the trunk on the dashboard there. So as soon as I apply this, um, these, these settings are going to try to register to my provider. But my provider won't know how to get back to me. It needs to know who to reply to. Who do I tell that, that I've got the registration? Um, the signaling that it gets will tell it my local address here. And I don't need it to know that. I need it to know my public address. So we're going to go into PBX settings, SIP settings, and the NAT tab. In, in the... Way in time past, we used to check that NAT setting on the trunk, and that would send help send this external host address. Now they have this special checkbox here: use IP in SDP, and you check it. And that says send whatever number I put in here, or a dynamic DNS address, or whatever I put in here. I want to send with my packets to say, hey, this is where you reply to when contact. is hopefully blurred out but if not it's fine this is our test system so uh, it changes frequently now my local network is here now, I have phones across my 10 11 12 I have all across the system so I'm going to type in 172 30 0, 0 slash 16 and that covers anything in the 172.30 subnet is considered local to me. So it doesn't need to tell anything that's coming from here about this address. And anything that's going outside doesn't need to know about these addresses. And that's kind of how it separates it for us and tells the right, right entities the right information. Now this setting is going to require me to reboot the system but I'm not going to do that yet. I'm going to apply my changes first so I don't lose my other settings. And then it's going to prompt 
for a reboot again. And upon coming back up, my trunks should register. So I'm going to pause and we'll be right back. All right, reboot is done. We're going to log back in here. And it's going to take us right to that dashboard. And you can see the, the trunks we've made. The analog line tells me there's nothing available because there's nothing plugged into those. We can see PX1 and PX5 went blue. We can hover over that and see registered and registered. This means that I've got my firewall settings right and I've got my NAT settings right that we just, that we just changed. The firewall settings are something completely different. Um, you've got to have the access from the outside world in through your firewall and point traffic on, on your on your SIP port, which by default is 5060, and your RTP streams, which is by default are, are 10,000 to 20,000, and have those forwarded straight to your phone system. Um, and if that's not in place, your trunks will not register. Uh, that, that'll be shown in a separate video. Now, now that we've got our trunks made, we can move on to the next step. That step is inbound routes. So let's, oh, let's look at this one. So we've created our trunks. Now we can do our outbound and inbound routes. And uh, we already talked about if we're using SIP trunks, let's set up that external host. Um, again, that's in PBX SIP NAT if you didn't catch it before. All right. <clears throat> How to set up your inbound and outbound routes. So we're going to go to extensions and trunk, and let's do the easy one first. That's the outbound routes. So we've already got our trunks made, and we add some rules. Um, it's possible to put all of these in one rule and, and send it all with the same privilege level and just do it. I don't recommend that. You need people to be able to do things differently than each other. For example, you want every person in existence to be able to call 911. So we're going to make a path for that. When 911 is called, and that's represented by the underscore 911, and if you're not sure about this terminology, hover over the word pattern here, and it'll give you a good explanation of what you can use for letters and numbers and periods and exclamations and what they mean. Once you've got your, your path here, the underscore 911, you can uh, choose if it, uh, the route needs a password or a pin or anything like that. Uh, by default, I don't mess with any of this stuff. I just give it a privilege level. And the privilege level is internal, which means anyone, anyone at all, can use this, this rule. Um, you can enable source filter on caller ID, which disables the privilege level and lets you pick which extensions can use it. Um, but uh, we want everybody to use it, so we're not going to use that. We're going to leave it internal. And it warns us. It's potentially security risk because anybody can do it. So you wouldn't want to set your international right route with an internal level. Anyway, what path is it going to take? Which trunk is it going to use? It's going to use PX1. Is it going to strip or prepend any digits? No. What about the backup trunk? We're going to add a failover trunk. If, if PX1 fails, I want it to use PX5. And then I have to save that down here, and it moves the failover into here. So any failover trunks you add have to be saved down here to be added to the order. If you don't save it down here, it's not going to save. Now, we don't want to use the analog trunk. I was just showing you that it would add. And I save that row. Now, it's going to warn me again that internal level means anyone can use it, and that's risky. I'm going to add another one. Some people have local numbers, and, and if you have a local number, it's usually seven digits long. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it doesn't matter if I use capital X's or lowercase X's, so if you like to see it differently, I can see three digits followed by four digits, but it's still X's, so it doesn't matter. X represents any number, any digit from zero to nine. And I realize I could use Z's and I could use N's, but I use X's for almost everything because it's simpler. 
Now, most providers won't accept a seven-digit number anymore, but a lot of smaller companies still like to dial their seven-digit numbers. We can, we can accommodate that. So you put in this route for seven digits. This one we're going to set to local permissions. So not quite anybody, but any extension that has local rights will be able to use this route. The first place they're going to try is PX1. But our provider needs a one and the, and the area code. So we're going, to, we're going to say the area code is 888. So we're going to strip no digits, and we're going to prepend a 1888. That will put the 1888 onto any seven digit number before it sends it out this trunk. So even though our provider doesn't accept seven digit numbers, our phone system can. And then add what it needs on and send it out. And we're going to do the same thing here. Now, some providers don't require the one, but we're going to pretend like ours does just for the sake of showing you. The next route you will need is long distance. Now, if your provider accepts, um, if your provider accepts both 10 and 11 digit numbers, you can go like this. One, two, three, four. You can see how I use the capital X's to show the middle three numbers so you can count easier. Now this would work. I could do this because if I had a provider that accepted both 10 and 11 digit numbers. Now in our case, we don't have that. So we're going to call this 10 digit. And this requires national rights because this is kind of a long distance call. And it's going to use PX1. We're not going to strip anything, but we're going to prepend the one on there. And then we have to do the same thing for our failover trunk. And save. And because we have two different ways people dial out, underscore one, national rights, PX1. Now we don't have to strip or prepend anything for this one. We just have to say it's allowed to go. That adds the 11 digit. Now, here's the weird one. A lot of people don't do this one. And I call it plus. Sometimes a, a incoming call will have a plus sign at the start of it. So you'll see plus one followed by the number. So when you try to call out from your own uh, call log, it says, I don't know how to process that number. And the, the phone will send the call because we tell it to, and it looks like this, plus one followed by 10 digits. And the system doesn't know what to do with it. But we're smart enough, we know what to do with it. We should take off the plus sign and send it anyway. So that's what we're gonna tell it. I want you to strip off one digit and send it anyway. And that one digit will be the plus sign. And even though each route is each path that we chose is national rights, we had to make three different routes to accommodate the three different types of numbers that might go out. The last one is international. Very simple. Underscore every international call starts with 011, followed by a number and any number of digits that you want, period. If you hover over here, you'll see that the period is a wildcard matching one or more characters. So I could, I could actually get away with 011 dot, and that would be fine too. But I like my exit, so I do that. Because it's 011 followed by any number of digits. And when you're done and your timer hits, it will send the call. But we don't want anybody to be able to call internationally. So we set this one to the highest level of rights possible. And we do the same thing, still PX1, don't strip or prepend anything, and then PX5. So I have my primary route and my failover. And those are my outbound routes. Now, if I wanted custom routes or things going to peer trunks and stuff like that, 
we can do all of that too, but for the sake of simplicity, this is a working phone system. You can call your 911, you can call locally, you can call long distance, and you can call internationally. And you can limit these any way you see fit. Now the inbound routes are similar. Um, a little more complicated um, with the possibilities that are there, but, but they're not too bad. So how to create inbound routes. So again, under extension trunks, click on inbound routes, and you can see up at the top here, we have trunks. Analog one, PX1, PX5. We have to create our inbound routes separately for each trunk. So with our SIP trunks, anything I do on PX1, I also have to do again on PX5. Now, if we would have used one of those trunk groups, um, which we couldn't do for our setup, but if we were using one, we had five trunks in one, then you only have to do it on one inbound route and you're good. So we're gonna start here by hitting add, and we're gonna look at what we've created. Let's start with 888-555-1230. The first thing you have to know is how the provider is going to send the call to you. Underscore, that means let's start in my pattern. Are they going to send it like this? What is it? One, two, three, zero. Or are they going to send it like this? You don't need them both. But if they send it with the one and you don't have the one on there, it's not going to work. And if they don't send it with a one, but you only have the one on there, it's not going to work. If you put both of them in there, it doesn't matter. It will work. Um, but then you have to do that for every single one. So if you know how your provider sends the calls, then you only need one of these in there, not both. So we're going to say that our provider sends it with the one. And it comes in 888-555-1230. Where does it go? It goes to IVR1. So we're going to go and look at the path here. We don't mess with the caller ID pattern. We don't prepend anything. We don't tag an alert info, any of that. We go right down to default destination. And it's going to an IVR. IVR1. Now if we had after hour options and holiday options, you would add those in here. You'd say outside of office time, I want it to go to voicemail or something like that. And you can send it differently based on the time conditions that you set up. But just like the failover routes, if you don't hit save here, it's not going to go into place. You've got to hit save down here or it won't save. I say on holidays, we're going to go to IVR2. So this route says if this number is dialed during normal hours, normal operations, by default, it's just going to go here straight to IVR1. If it's outside of office time, we're going to dump it to voicemail. And if it's on a holiday, we're going to dump it to IVR2. So it can do three different things based on the time condition. Whatever I do on this trunk, I have to duplicate on PX5. And I have to do the exact same thing. Okay, 555, And default destination, IVR1, failover, out of office time, go to voicemail, save, failover, holidays, go to IVR. Two. Now this is the only one I'm going to put the time failovers on. Just to, I wanted to show you what it would look like. Um, we can get more specific with this and choose even specific time conditions and narrow it down on Mondays from 5 to 3, do this. But we're not going to look at all that right now. Once you have that in, save. And it is now on both trunks. If it's on one and the call fails over to the second trunk, it doesn't know what to do with it. So it's got to be on both trunks that you have if you use failover trunks. Let's look at the next one. I'm going to ring group 
two. And because we've already created all these, we can now do our inbound routes. Get our phone number right. We don't need a failover, so that route's good. And this is what you do, again, for PX5. I'm going to skip PX5 for now, just for the sake of time. This one, go back to my thing, call Q1. And each number can go to a different place. Underscore one eight 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 five 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 one two three three is going to outside number. So just going down external number. Tell it right where it's going. The call will come in, not even do anything on the system, and immediately call out and forward to that number. Now your SIP provider has to allow that as well. So if your SIP provider won't allow for that to happen, then the call will fail no matter what you do. One, two, three, four. Go straight to voicemail. Now you can see on here how you can track all of these. Your numbers go in the order that you entered them and they're not movable. So whatever way you put them in is the way you want to see them. If you want to see them numerically in order over here, enter them in numerically in order over here. Um, unfortunately, there's no way to... Who is there? Oh, you can sort them out. Ah, oh, nice. Cool. So it looks like the first two tabs now let you sort numerically, which is actually a new feature. Good deal. All right, so the first one, you can see the default goes to IVR1, and out of office time goes to the voicemail, and on holiday goes to IVR2. And it breaks it all down for you right here on the one screen. And each of these just go to their respective places. And so you can quickly see where each call is going right on the screen. This is where you go, well, that seems like a lot of work. What if I have a hundred different numbers? Well, it's not so bad, as long as your numbers are sequential. So this last one, 800, 555, 6200 to 6300. Each, each extension that we created is going to get its own DID, a direct inbound dial that goes straight from their number. So 6200 will go straight to 1200. 6201 will go to 1201. So on, all the way up to 6300 will go to 1300. And you can do this with as many extensions as you want, but I'm going to show you how to route it in one easy route. So we add in the numbers. Let's see if I can do this right. Um, underscore 1888 6XXX. Because it's the last three digits that can be anything. But all the numbers are starting with 800. Or I did 800, 555, 6, 200 to 6, 300. So after the 6 is when they change. Let me fix that here. It should be 800. And so you put X's in for the ones that are unknown. Now here's where it gets neat. Down here under default destination, one of the options is by DID. And that allows you to bring in all of those and the allowed DID extensions right now is just an extension. You can actually route like that to conference rooms or call queues or ring groups or anything like that if you so chose. The most common way to do it is by extension. So it's looking for extensions that match what I tell it. And the way it's going to match, we're going to strip off, starting from the left, we're going to strip off one, two, three, four, five, six, seven digits. Nope. Let's look at it again. Eight digits? Yeah, eight digits. Four and four. So we're going to strip off the first eight digits, replace it with a one, and keep what's left. 
So I'm going to strip off eight digits, prepend a one. So if the number 6200 came in, it would strip off everything except for the 200, and then it would put a one on the front of it, which would be 1200. So the first number would route to 1200. And we save it. And so it's by DID, strip off all eight digits that's come in at the start. And this is where it's important that you know whether they send the one or not. So this one matters. You have to know how they send it. And you strip off all the first digits, prepend the number. So this only works if the extensions are sequential. You can even do this if you don't own a few numbers in the middle because you just won't receive them and that's fine but you can do the whole stretch of an entire sequence of numbers very, very quickly doing it this way. So you have to do this, like I said again, on PX5. PX5 here, the second trunk has to look exactly like the first one, otherwise when the calls fail over, they simply won't work. And that's it, that's how you set up your inbound routes. Once you have your inbound routes and your outbound routes and your trunks are gone, you should be ready to go. You should be able to make calls. So we're going to apply these changes and see what we look like. All right, system status, dashboard. We have working trunks. We have extensions that currently aren't connected to any phones yet. And we have outbound routes and inbound routes. So calls can come in, calls can go out, we have voicemail set up. That's the basics of our system. At this point, your system is set up. It, it can function as of right now. Um, but there are some fine-tuning items to look at. And right now I'm not going to teach you how to connect your phones to your extensions and go through all of those settings, but uh, that video will come in the future. For now, we just wanted to get you a working Grandstream system. But I am going to quickly go over the other miscellaneous settings that you will need to mess with. So, we have opened our system up to the rest of the world. And that means that people can attack us if they want. Um, so we need to go to security settings, which is under system settings and security. And we need to turn on the ability to, to block people when they start to come in. So that's in security settings. It's called fail to ban. And you just have to turn it on. Um, I also turn on the Astro service and the login attack defense. So if people are trying to log in on port 89 or 5060. If you enable other ports, it'll activate those checkboxes as well. Um, if you know your SIP provider's IP address, um, you can enter the, in the whitelist. If you use the, uh, where is it? Service check. If you have used the service check, you need to come into here and whitelist yourself. Um, I usually whitelist a lot of things. Uh, for example, my local networks, I whitelist, that's my SIP provider. That's the other SIP trunk. So this is PX1, this one's PX5. That's myself. In case I accidentally do that. But there's lots of, of things you can whitelist to protect yourself. If you have somebody out in the world that uh, is remotely connecting their phone in, you'll want to whitelist them so they can't accidentally get banned. But once you turn this on, anybody that attempts to, to, to log in and fails five times, within 600 seconds, which is 10 minutes, and they're banned for 10 minutes. I usually change this one to 86400 because there's 86400 seconds in a day. And so it'll ban them for the whole day. Anybody that gets banned shows up down here. So that's how you block that particular side of things. Um, parking slots, a lot of people like to use parking slots and they like to uh, have speed dial buttons for them. If you do that, you need to come into parking lot under uh, call features and say treat parking lots as extensions. 
one little setting change. Help, super duper helpful. Uh, what other miscellaneous settings we got? We talked about PBX at NAT. Um, talked about security um, time. You need to make sure your time zone's right. Set your office time and set up your holidays. It's important. Email settings. Configure your email settings. It's important. Users. Have backup users. Do not give everybody your admin password. We talked about the operation log at one point. How everything gets logged here, but not everything gets logged in system events. So come in here and turn off all turn on all of your alerts. You can get email notifications if you want, but that gets kind of excessive. Upgrade regularly. If you're going to upgrade, back up always. System cleanups helps you keep the system clean. And at the very bottom here, zero config. This is a quick, easy way to assign extensions to your phones. And I'm not going to go through it now. We don't have phones set up for this. But you can quickly assign 50 extensions to 50 phones with basic settings. You can really customize things with the templates. Um, finally, when all is said and done, and, and this is important, please don't forget this because you will regret it um, when you have an issue. Because just like any computer, a phone system is a computer and it will have issues at some point. You need to maintain it. You need to give it upkeep, keep it clean, make sure it's cool, um, make sure it gets its updates. And as you're doing all of that, make sure you back up. You can do a scheduled backup so it backs up for you, um, or you can simply come in and add a backup. I want just my config file or I want everything. If you do just the config file, you can save it locally. It tells the backup file, puts the today's date in there, 2018, 8, 14. So today is August 14th of 2018. I don't know what this number means. I will often change it to be the version of firmware that I'm working on. 18.9, I think it was, something like that. And so I know what firmware I took that back up from, on what date, and that helps me out sometimes. Click backup, and it will do the process. It's important. Please don't forget it. All right, at that point, we have our, our backup done. Our system is running. Um, we can test inbound and outbound calls. You can see them in active calls. The dashboard gives you a summary. It even tells us that we now have fail to ban turned on, but we have not set our scheduled backups yet. We have 101 extensions, of which zero are registered. We have no conference room, but two call queues and 20 parking slots. And, and really, it just tells us a lot of stuff right on this dashboard. So if you have questions for us, please reach out to us, uh, n2vsolutions.com. You can call us at 507-205-4025. Um, if you do call us, you will find me. I will be the guy, one of the guys helping you, and uh, we're happy to do it. We're happy to, to do remote support. We can reach out to you anywhere in the world and uh, help you set this thing up and keep it maintained. So. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time.